Now, in terms of the graph that we want to plot, there are three things that we want to keep in mind. But let me talk about the graph that we want to draw first. Huh? Because in this case, what I have in the diagram here, I am drawing it very narrow because I want to show you this information here. But because we will have a discussion involving reaction number one as well as reaction number two, so what you do is when you draw this guy, you try to draw it longer. You try to do it, uh, draw it fatter. Let me show you uh, the graph first. That means in this case later, you look something like this. This will be the first equivalence. This will be the second equivalence. So you try to draw it wider. Then later, your titration curve will look nicer. So the three points that we want to look out for for diprotic species will be the initial pH, maximum buffering capacity for reaction number one, MBC for reaction number two. So we have two... Uh, equivalence volume. So this will be for the first reaction. Of course, you just think that, okay, this is reaction number one. You don't need to physically draw it in. All right, this, this region here is reaction number one from zero to the first VEQ. Then after that, from the first VEQ to the second VEQ, this will be reaction number two. Remember, reaction number one is this, huh? And reaction number two will be this guy, correct? And of course, I'm adding sodium hydroxide along the way. Then later, we want to plot what will happen to the pH of the solution along the way. Now this pH equals to 7, usually we will still put it in, but later we will comment on that. Okay, so the first point, let us try to consider how do I determine the initial pH of the solution. Now if it is a diprotic acid, by right it should give me 2 H pluses. The first acid will be able to dissociate to give me 1 H plus. Then your second acid will be able to dissociate to give me the second H plus. So you notice if I try to work out the total H plus concentration from both species, it's actually a bit troublesome because I have two terms to worry about. The first acid versus the second acid because both of them are acidic. Both of them can give me H+. What we do again is we just do an approximation. I just assume that the contribution of H+, just comes from the first dissociation. The second acid contribution of H+, is negligible. So we just assume all the H+, come from the first dissociation. We will just treat it as a monoprotic acid. So again, you notice that even if it is for diprotic species, we just treat it, if I want to determine the pH of the solution, I just treat it as monoprotic. I only care about the first dissociation. So therefore, H plus will be the square root of Ka times weak acid concentration. This one will go back to the formula of a weak acid, correct? Then my weak acid will be the first acid, H2C2O4. So therefore, Ka that I'm using, I have to use Ka1, correct? If the acid is H2C2O4, I'll be using Ka1. If the acid is HC2O4 minus, if it is the second acid, then I'll use Ka2. And from there, I can determine the pH of the solution. Of course, in this case, uh, we are not having any value here, but we can just estimate, okay, maybe somewhere here. I'll just mark this spot here. You just take note of it. Now, pH will be less than 7. If you are given the value, we can calculate that. In this case, we will just estimate it. The next thing that we want to talk about will be the second point. We want to show this region here from 0 to VEQ. During reaction number 1, we have a buffer. So therefore, we can calculate the maximum buffering capacity. So the discussion is here. Let me show you. Now, during reaction number 1, what is the scenario here? Now, remember the scenario is the titration uh, is I'm titrating a strong base with your H2C2O4, which is a weak acid. The weak acid, it is in the conical flask. The strong base, it is in the B-rack. So hopefully, if you can uh, determine the buffer region for previous instances where we talked about monoprotic acid-base reaction, uh, if I have a weak guy in a conical flask, a strong guy, it is in the B-rack, the weak guy will be in excess before complete neutralization. So therefore, I'll have a buffer before VEQ. So this idea is exactly the same. I'll have a buffer. Now, what is this buffering system? The buffering system will be a mixture of your h 2 c 2 o and h c 2 o minus my weak acid and the conjugate base. So this should be the buffering system. And therefore, we will have one point that I can plot for my maximum buffering capacity. Now, what is interesting is in this case, if I want to plot the first MBC, uh, volume is at half equivalence, which shouldn't be a problem. I know that if the buffer region is before complete neutralization, my buffer will be at half VEQ, the volume will be a half equivalence. How about my pH? I know that I know that the pH is equal to pKa, but which is the pKa value that we should be using? Should I use Ka1 or should I use Ka2? Because what is interesting here 
is you notice H2C2O4, this guy, it is an acid, it has a K value, Ka1. This guy, H2C2O4 minus, earlier we have mentioned, right, this guy is also an acid. The second acid, this guy also has a Ka value, Ka2. So if this has Ka1, this also has Ka value, Ka2, which is the Ka value that I should be using for this buffering system. Hopefully, we are not that confused about it because uh, it is fairly simple. What we have to ask ourselves is, inside this buffering system, who is the acid and who is the base? All right? Inside this buffering system, obviously, this H2C2O4 with the additional H+, this will act as the acid. H2O4- will function as the base. So therefore, inside this buffering system, which is the Ka value that we should be focusing on, I should be focusing on the Ka value for H2C2O4. Because inside this system, your H2O4- minus, the blue color guy, it is not acting as the acid, it is acting as the base. pH is equal to pKa1 from a H2C2O4. Again, in order for us to be very clear in terms of the concept, the link has to be very strong. Remember earlier we mentioned each of these guys has a Ka value. This guy is Ka1 because this is the first acid. This is the second acid. This is Ka2. So as long as I know that, okay, this one should be the acid, the Ka value instinctively I should be, the, I should be using the Ka value for this guy. I'll be thinking of Ka1. I will not use Ka2. Conversely, for some reason, if let's say this guy is functioning as the acid, then the K value that we will be using is, I'll be using Ka2, I will not use Ka1. The link has to be very clear. And if I consider buffer, remember, inside this buffering system, even though both of them has Ka value, but I don't need both of them to function as my acid. Because remember, in any buffering system, we already mentioned many times, right? Buffer is acid plus base. I need one guy to be the acid, I need one guy to be the base. So in this case, if this is the acid, this guy has to be the base. So therefore, if I talk about the Ka value, I'm focusing on the acid, I have to use the Ka value for the acid. Even if this guy has a Ka value, inside this buffering system, he is not acting as the acid. So the Ka value for this guy is not important. and It is not relevant. Okay, huh? hopefully we are clear with that. Again, all these things rolls back to, uh, do you know that buffer is made out of an acid and a base? So if you are very clear about it, then, you focus on, if I want to use Ka value, the focus is just between these two guys, who is the acid? The yellow guy is the acid, you use the Ka for the yellow guy. H2C2O4, so therefore I should be using Ka1. I will not think of using Ka2 at all. Okay? So this is one point that we can plot. So if I come back to here, uh, maybe my half equivalence is somewhere here. Let me just try to roughly put it in. Uh, my half VQ will be here. Now, my pKa1 will be less than pKa2 because if I come back to here, earlier we have mentioned that uh, if I'm a stronger acid, I'll have a bigger Ka value, Ka1 will be larger. So therefore, the pKa, corresponding pKa will be smaller. The bigger the Ka value, the smaller the pKa. So if my Ka1 is larger, it will mean that pKa1 will be smaller than pKa2. So let me just uh, roughly estimate Somewhere here, lah, huh? somewhere here. So maybe I'll just uh, aim one point here. So um, of course, this will be my uh, pKa1. All right, so this will be a point that I can plot. This is my MBC. Again, maximum buffering capacity gradient at the point is equal to zero. So we'll aim for gradient equals to zero. Now this point again is a very nice point because it tells me something about the shape of the graph at that point, before and after that point. Very, very nice point to plot. So this is the first maximum buffering capacity. Now, if you roughly get this idea, involving region or reaction number one, there's a buffer, so therefore that is a, there's an MBC, there's a maximum buffering capacity, then we will be able to deduce the same thing for the second reaction. We want to show that during the second reaction, there's also a buffer, so therefore there's also a maximum buffering capacity that we can plot, which is actually here. Let me show you that. So involving the second reaction, then uh, the scenario is this, right? My sodium hydroxide, I titrate with this guy, H2O4 minus. Now the scenario is exactly the same. I'm still reacting a weak acid against my strong base. Strong base reacting with a weak acid. So before the end of the second equivalence, 
this weak guy will still be in excess before complete neutralization. So therefore, again, the second region during the second reaction will be another buffer. So if it is another buffer, then I can calculate the MBC for the second buffer region. Of course, the first thing we have to decide is uh, what is the buffering system? What are the components inside this buffering system? So the acid will be my HC2O4 minus, then the base will be my C2O4 2 minus. So the buffering system is this, uh, between H C2O4 minus and C2O4 2 minus. Again, we have to be very clear in terms of who is the acid and the base. So later when I calculate my pH, I will know that okay the pH will be the pKa for the acid. In this case, obviously, it will be HC2O4 minus. I have to use Ka2. I cannot use Ka1. All right. So very uh, simple. If it is Ka, then we focus on the acid. If it is Kb, we focus on the base for buffer equation. Now, uh, what it might be a bit confusing is this volume. Uh, how come the volume to give me maximum buffering capacity is 3 over 2 VEQ? Why is it not double VEQ? Because previously we have talked about my buffer region, if it is before complete neutralization, it is half equivalence. After complete neutralization, it will be double equivalence. But in this case, uh, the buffer region is still before complete neutralization, but it is before the end of the second reaction. So let me uh, clarify what we mean. Why is it 3 over 2 VEQ or 1.5 VEQ? The first VEQ is to settle reaction number 1. Because if reaction number 1 is not completed, the second reaction doesn't come out. It's therefore, the second buffering system doesn't come out. This half VEQ is to reach the maximum buffering capacity for the second reaction. Now, when we look at this calculation here, it might seem a bit confusing. But if I go back to the graph, it's actually very easy. Eh? As mentioned, we say that reaction number one, there's a buffer. So the maximum buffering capacity will be a half equivalence, it will be here. Half VEQ, correct? Now if I know that during the second reaction here, there's also a buffer region. So what is the, or where is the maximum buffering capacity? Half equivalence for this guy will be somewhere here. So if it is somewhere here, then what will this spot be? This spot will be half equivalence plus another equivalence. So this will be 3 over 2 VEQ. Remember, half VEQ is to reach the maximum buffering capacity for the second reaction. But before this second reaction will even start, I need to add VEQ to settle the first reaction. I need to end off the first reaction first, then the second reaction will start. So one VEQ to settle reaction number one, then reaction number two starts. Half VEQ to reach the maximum buffering capacity for this point here. Okay? So let me come back to here. Uh, in case we want to uh, take note of that. So remember, the second maximum buffering capacity is volume will be 3 over 2 VEQ. Again, maybe it seems a bit abstract here, but when you look at the graph, it's actually very easy. Huh? Half equivalence during the second reaction. Then pH will be equals to pKa2. Uh, pKa2 will be bigger than pKa1 because the Ka2 value it is smaller than Ka1. So therefore, we can again plot it on the titration curve. So let me go back to the curve there. Then I roughly show you uh, what we should look out for or how we should sketch out the titration curve for diprotic species because we don't have, or the focus is not so much on the uh, equivalence point. Eh? The focus is actually not so much on that. So let me go back to this graph here. So maybe my 3 over 2 VEQ is here and maybe my PKA2 uh, maybe is somewhere here. Let me just uh, put this as, at this spot here. P, K, A, 2, then I'll have my 3 over 2 VEQ here. So this spot will be the second MBC, gradient at the point is equals to zero. Now, uh, later I'll clarify, it's actually not a requirement for PKA1 to be always below seven, then PKA2 must be above seven. So this pH equals to seven, we have to be a bit flexible uh, depending on the actual KA values that they are given. Sometimes we need to adjust the position of my pKa1 and pKa2. In this case, this is just a rough sketch. So I'll just draw one below and one above. All right. Then how do I put everything together? All right. What we will do is we will focus on the buffer region. So you notice what I'm doing is I just draw the buffer region here. Then after that, I'll draw a second buffer region here. Then uh, where the buffer region joins to this VQ line, I'll just draw a vertical line to show the range of rapid pH change. Let me just show you part by part. 
I draw this portion here first to indicate the buffer region. All right. Then after that, I'll do the same for this portion here. So I don't, I don't care so much about the range of rapid pH change first. I draw the buffer region here. Then after that, where, wherever these two graphs, these two buffer region joins this VQ line, I just draw a vertical line. I just draw this vertical line down. So this will represent the range of rapid pH change for the end of the first reaction. And typically what I'll do is I'll try to roughly gauge, okay, what is this height here? I'll draw the same height for the second guy, for the second equivalence point. Of course, if you can't really do that, it doesn't really matter. After that, I'll just continue to draw this R. Then your titration curve for diprotic species uh, will roughly look like this. Again, it is pretty decent looking. Uh, basically, what we need to look out for will just be the initial pH and both maximum buffering capacity.